If you have your Bibles this morning, if you would turn in your Bibles to Luke 16, of course it will be up on the screen, and we're going to look at verses 19 through 31. Again, the Gospel of Luke, the 16th chapter, 16th, we'll be taking a look at verses 19 through 31. This is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away, with Lazarus by his side. So he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them <clears throat> so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Chasms gulfs, walls, barriers, enclosures, obstacles. How do these words make you feel? Secure, safe, or scared, vulnerable, divided, separated? Speaking about barriers, some are man-made, There we go. Oh, back up. Oh, once again, it's doing. Can you just, there we go. Thank you. Some are man-made and others are made by God. The physical universe created by God with its endless galaxies and solar systems is such a vast barrier that mankind has only begun to explore. Our space probes are so infinitesimally small that they are not even needles in the proverbial haystack. Here on Earth, for example, humans have only begun to explore about 5% of the ocean's floors. The depths of the oceans represent a chasm that God has made complete with species that we don't even know about today. Other barriers are made by man. For example, man creates barriers that separate and divide people. Some man-made barriers are designed to be protective, but generally they fail in that respect. Ever hear of the Great Wall of China? <laughs> At over 13,000 miles long, 13,000 miles long, it's equal to half the length of the equator around the Earth. This wall was designed to keep the Manchus from invading China. <laughs> How'd that work? <laughs> it didn't work at all. In fact, this is the only thing that can be seen from the moon when the astronauts went there. The only man-made object that could be seen was this 13,000-mile long wall, which failed to do its job. Other barriers are erected so we don't have to see the other, however we define the other, the poor, disabled, non-citizens, etc. As a Holocaust seminar teacher with many years of teaching that subject, I instantly think about what the Nazis did to the Jewish people with their walled ghettos where they concentrated hundreds of thousands of people 
in Warsaw in a place that was only 2.5 square miles and walled them off. Today in Luke, we encounter a Jesus parable that is a warning about a chasm that is completely impenetrable between those in heaven and those persons in hell. One that no one can cross, as the rich man in the story found out too late. What is the relationship between walls that man has made and the eternal wall of separation that Jesus speaks of between heaven and hell? Are we going to be held account to account for systems of oppression that we have created to take advantage of the poor, to isolate them, and to ignore their suffering by not even seeing them? What would Jesus say? Yes, we will be held accountable. The good news about man-made walls is this, that if we build them, then we can also what? Tear them down. If we want to do so, we can start including other people into our care and concern, people we don't even know, those whom Jesus calls our neighbor, and treat everyone as a child of God. The bad news is that if we don't do this and choose to live a life of self-contentment, self-concern, and exclusion of others, we are building brick by brick by brick by brick a wall that will be impenetrable for us at the final judgment. Warning, friends, we might end up on the wrong side of that chasm, the side that church attendance alone <laughs> will not save you from being on. You hear me? Church attendance alone is not what's going to do it. Let's examine this parable, which is unique to the Gospel of Luke, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. You won't find it and the other three Gospels. You just find it in Luke. Luke's overarching themes that we've been looking at the past few weeks, see if, you, if this sounds familiar to you, justice for the poor, inviting everyone to the table. Remember those themes from previous sermons? So that's what Luke is very concerned about. So Jesus has basically been taking the Pharisees to task, the so-called religious people, the ultra-religious people, for their exploiting of the poor and ignoring the suffering of others while they claim to be so mm, holy due to following all of the letter of the law while violating the very essence of what God wants us to do in this life. The law doesn't save. The letter of the law, you'll find no salvation there, dear Christian friends. Remember the instructions of Jesus, that we should invite everyone to the table, not just folks that we like, but the poor, the lame, the blind, the alien, the immigrant, the migrant. And if we want to basically one day share a feast at his heavenly banquet, Jesus says we ought to be an inviting and welcoming people. So the story begins with two men, a rich man and a beggar named Lazarus. Jesus doesn't tell us much about their backgrounds, but he does provide us with some clues. The rich man is never given a name by Jesus. And I think, I really think that's because we ought to hear our name in there. Whether we're a man or a woman, we ought to hear our name in there. Because this is a parable of a warning. The rich man is unnamed by Jesus, but he is very rich. Note that he wore purple every day. In his day, purple was the most expensive dye of the ancient world and in global history was traded by the Phoenicians, and it was used to dye the clothing of royalty. Not only that, but the rich man was wearing linen, linen of the finest quality. His threads, his thread count was mighty high. Did Jesus tell us how he got his money? No. Did Jesus tell us if the money was inherited or if the rich man had been a really good businessman? No. So for all we know, he could have been an honest businessman who earned his money fair and square. But as we shall see, this makes absolutely no difference in the story. The other man, Lazarus, lay at the rich man's gate. By the way, church, don't think that this man is the same Lazarus who was raised from the dead by Jesus. Lazarus was a common name in the Middle East at the time, in Palestine. Second, the Greek meaning of the word lay, L-A-Y, means that Lazarus was laid here by someone. 
Someone came and dropped him off by whom we don't know. Some nameless person brought Lazarus to the very gate of the richest man in the town. Today we would say his front doorstep, his front doorstep, hoping that the rich man or one of his guests might stop and have some pity on this man. Next, and this should break your heart, church, we're told that Lazarus longed to eat the scraps of food that fell off the rich man's table. Now, I was working the vacuum cleaner the other day for Melanie. Yes, I do that work. Husbands, do y'all help out of the house with your broom and your mop and your vacuum cleaners? Because that's that work is for us as well, right? So I was vacuuming, and were there crumbs under the Godfrey's table? There were. Now, we have kitty cats in door. They're very picky, though. Cats are like, I like it. I ain't eating it, and they won't eat it. Dogs are different. If, if the beagle's in from outdoors, she eats everything that hits that floor. But I thought about that as I emptied the crumbs out of that uh, tube of vacuum cleaner that's bagless. Would I want to eat the stuff that's off the floor, the crumbs? And the answer is no, right? But this man was longing just to have some crumbs. He was really hungry, right? Now listen to this. Um, this activity... That, uh, that dogs normally do, eating crumbs off the floor. Is Jesus saying that the rich man saw Lazarus as lower than the dogs by ignoring him? And speaking of the four-legged creature known as man's best friend, look at the role that dogs play in Jesus' story. They are the only ones giving him comfort in this lifetime. They're licking his sores. In the ancient world, they believed that dog saliva was medicinal. Today, however, we know that cats and dogs' mouth contains a bacteria called Pastorella that can cause a skin infection. So you don't want to say, hey, come here. I got a wound. You got to fell outside in the yard and let your dog clean it up. Now go to your medicine cabinet, get out your antiseptic and your Band-Aids, right? But the main point I want to make here again is that the dogs are acting by instinct with more compassion towards Lazarus than the rich man. So I believe Jesus is playing with this idea in the story. Who is really lower than the dogs? Lazarus or the rich man? Lazarus or the rich man? Next, both persons die. And Jesus says something so beautifully that you might miss its, uh, its significance. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham while the father of the Jewish nation, the first patriarch of the Jewish people. Wow. Do you remember singing Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham? Y'all remember that song in BBS? Come on now. You, you sing it? All right. I'm one of them and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. So this Abraham is very important, very important. So the rich man also dies and he goes to a different place. The kids were like, oh, we can't say it. Our kids need to know that hell is real. Hell has a name and it's called what? Hell. You can call it Hades if you wish and use the Greek name for it. But hell is hell. Hell is the opposite of heaven. Anyway, this would have shocked, the, the, the whole story would have shocked the Pharisees, and I'll tell you why. Because in their day and time, they believed the rich were rich because they were being blessed by God. They believed the poor were, were poor because they were being rejected by God. So they saw riches and fine clothes and fine houses as a sign of favor by God. So now in this story, we get the opposite. We get the, the, the beggar getting to go to heaven to be next to Abraham. This would have just floored the Pharisees, right? The rich man in Hades sees both of them across this divide. Or does he? Or does he? Even then, did you notice you can miss the little details of the Bible so easy? He never addresses Lazarus, ever. Not one time in the story. He sees both of them. Who does he talk to? Abraham. Uh, hey, Father Abraham, uh, have mercy on me down here and send Lazarus to my aid. I beg you. I need some water for my tongue. It's an agony from the flames. Church, is the rich man still not getting it? Lazarus is expected to serve him by bringing him water in hell? 
why the rich man didn't even offer Lazarus table scraps on earth? Does he still perceive Lazarus as lower than him? Boy, does Abraham burst the rich man's bubble. He says, no, this can't be done because the chasm between heaven and hell, it's too wide and it's too deep and no one can cross that barrier. In his woe, the rich man then begs Abraham, get ready for it, send Lazarus to my father's house. Warn my five brothers that they need to be more generous in life so they won't end up like I am in torment. Okay, several points here. Time out. This rich, rich man still thinks of Lazarus as a servant to be sent somewhere at his request. And second, he is only capable about worrying about his own kin, in this case, his own five brothers. Abraham says no, and that if they won't listen to Moses and all the prophets' warnings about taking care of the poor, they will not believe that someone came from the dead to warn them. Folks, I want to, as I wind this up, this story does not mean that all rich people are going to hell. That is not what Jesus was saying. It is not a, a parable that says money equals hell. <laughs> it is a warning from Jesus to all who would listen, Pharisees then, us today, that caring for other people and giving the poor justice in this life is an expectation of everyone. Our reading from 2 Timothy 6 that was read also reminds us of this, for we brought nothing into this world so that we can take nothing out of it. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. The rich man in hell you better believe he was pierced with many pains. And it was a pain of his own making. Church, the question is, are we going to be afflicted by the same sins? Church, which side of the chasm do you wish to be on? And how will it inform the way you live your life? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Church family, at this time, if you will pull out this little insert that looks like a half a sheet that's a white piece of paper. I don't know if you know this or not, but we have a lot of committees in the Methodist Church. <laughs> and I'm interested maybe in the future of looking at something called alternative structure, which is in the Book of Discipline. But for now, I believe by my count and Mitzi's count, there's like 13 committees that need people to serve on these committees. And let me just say this, there was a time in my life, I really want you to listen to me. There was a time in my life where I would just float in on Sunday morning to church and I never thought a thing about anything in preparation for that Sunday service. I never thought about the flowers on the table or the altar stands. I never thought about the choir practicing. I never thought about the musicians practicing their music. I never thought about anything that went into having a service. Church, God demands our very best, so we don't just open the door and just see what's going to happen. And church cannot be a Sunday morning thing only. It, this is a seven-day-a-week operation where people call, they need help. They need a pastor. They need a friend. They need connections. And all of this requires the willingness of the people of God to serve. Now, let me say this. A lot of people say, well, that book of discipline, watch out. I found out when 9 out of 10 Methodists quote it, they don't know what they're talking about. I, I'm sorry. I found it to be true. All right. There's only membership is required for some of committees, but for most of them, the Book of Discipline does not say that, which is saying that everyone can serve on these committees. Everyone can serve on them. And so I'm going to basically pause at this time. We're going to have a little prayer. I'm going to ask you earnestly, because I, t I planted this seed last week, did I not? I told you that today we'd be discussing this. And we're going to fill out this in just a moment and drop it in the offering plate.
That's what we're going to do. Remember my children's message about the snooze button? Please don't hit the snooze button. Maybe next year, Pastor. Pastor, I've got a lot going on. Don't hit the snooze button. Okay? Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glorious day and for letting us have another day here in this life. We thank you for the beauty of the fall, for them birds that just started their little singing outside. God, you are amazing. And Lord, we ask as we take just a couple of minutes or so to take a look at an opportunity to serve, that we would not view it, Lord, negatively as something that has to be done or something that's oppressive that takes away our time and energy, but rather this is something that you are calling all of us to do, which is to serve your church here on the corner, which has a nickname chosen for it before I became the pastor called the Servant Church, the Servant Church. Be with us, Heavenly Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a few minutes and read over this. There's a little description of the committees, very brief. And then if, if you, Spirit's leading you, if you put down your name on some of the slots. We got some pens. Hold your hands up. Our heads and have a little offertory prayer heavenly father again your goodness and mercy is plainly obvious to all of us lord we have had so many blessings blessings upon blessings upon blessings god we thank you for your eternal goodness to us now lord as we go into this portion of our service or we turn in these slips of paper and any tithes and offerings lord we offer not just the paper not just the money but we offer ourselves to you, mind, body, and soul. We are yours. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and chasms, walls, not of man-made hands, but things made by God. The most important being that great chasm between life with God and life apart from Him eternally. Church, every day, God will give us a choice to make, a series of choices. And in the end, the small ones are just as important as the big ones. 
Make sure we live a life worthy of the name Christian that we offer, the help and the succor and the comfort to all who might need us. And then we will be blessed and we will feast at his heavenly banquet. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. The king of my heart, flee the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, is my song. You are good, you're good. Oh, you are good, you're good. Oh, let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, he's my soul. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he's my song. You are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh. Have a great rest of your Sunday.